I ask myself internally what I hope politicians of all parties will be asking. Why is it, and is it a good thing, that sentences in England and Wales are so much longer than sentences in France and in Germany and in Italy and in Holland and Scandinavia? I don't lie awake at night. I just don't. And I struggle to see how anyone could hold down a really demanding job if they really did lie awake at night. What I fear is that politicians generally don't really understand the judiciary and, if I'm being honest about it, don't really have it in their bones a feel for the constitutional arrangements that we have. This is The Judges, Power, Politics and the People, hosted by the University of Law. This week, I'm speaking with Lord Burnett of Malden. Ian Burnett recently stepped down as Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales after six years in that post. In 2019, he and two other judges ruled that the suspension of Parliament under Boris Johnson was a political matter with which judges should not interfere. The Supreme Court thought otherwise and ruled unanimously that Burnett and his colleagues were wrong. Then came the Court of Appeal ruling in 2023 that the government's plans to send illegal asylum seekers to Rwanda were unlawful. Burnett backed the government, but he was outvoted by his fellow judges two to one. He was educated at St John's College, Portsmouth and studied jurisprudence at Pembroke College, Oxford. His practice at the bar was mainly in public and administrative law, where he carved out a career acting in public inquiries. These included the 1987 King's Cross fire, the convictions of the Guildford Forum Maguire 7, the 1997 South Hall and 1999 Labrook Grove rail crashes, and the inquests into the 1997 deaths of Diana, Princess of Wales, and Jodie Fired. I began by asking Lord Burnett how he felt now that he was no longer in the top job and was retired. I came to a very clear decision that um, after six years in office, it was long enough um, for all sorts of reasons, but um, including that the job is an extraordinarily demanding one and a very tiring one. Um, and also, after six years in a really big job, um, the job needs a change as well, in, in my view. And so I had come to terms completely with the fact that my life was going to change. I was looking forward to um, getting up in the morning without a very early alarm, looking forward to um, avoiding having to spend the first half an hour or hour of the day uh, at 6.30 going through emails and getting back into control of my life. So I hugely enjoyed being Lord Chief Justice, it was a great privilege, it's a remarkable job, um, but I'm happy to have um, left that Sit part down. of my life behind. What do you think you'll miss most about it? I think the real truth is people. People. I think in any big job, your professional life becomes pretty well all-absorbing, and professional colleagues become more than professional colleagues and men, many become close friends. So to um, officials with whom one works and um, not seeing all the people who one enjoys seeing all the time is, is actually the most difficult thing. Mm. Although you will, you will carry on with some of them and you're going to be active, aren't you? in the House of Lords, I think it's right to say. Yes, um, I'm hoping to be active in the House of Lords. Um, and uh, I'm also going to be um, uh, active from time to time sitting in the Supreme Court. But I shan't be in the Royal Courts of Justice all, all day, every day. I won't be in the temple as much as I have been. And so I won't be running into the people um, who I've been rubbing shoulders with professionally for over 40 years now. And you won't be sitting on cases, of course, or sentencing. Uh, certainly not, not, not here. I will be sitting on the odd case in the Supreme Court. Ah, oh, right. Okay. 
Can you do that as an extra? Uh, yes. You can be called in. Yes, to... there's a, the, the, the Supreme Court um, has the facility to have a, a supplementary panel of justices, um, and there are a handful of uh, retired, two, two or three retired Supreme Court justices and a former Chief Justice from Northern Ireland who are on the panel, and so am I. And uh, uh, Lord Reid has kindly asked me to sit from time to time. So looking, looking back at the six years, let's, let's start with that. What, what do you think has been the most challenging part of it? I think undoubtedly in, 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 in terms of energy um, and struggle, um, dealing with COVID. That was completely unexpected. Um, and uh, none of us was um, trained in how to deal with uh, a public emergency of, of that sort. It was an example of how a handful of really big decisions are what matter uh, and the need to avoid getting too lost in the weeds. Uh, I had to make a really big decision when COVID lockdown started. Which, uh, which was? Which was whether to keep the courts going as much as possible or not. Around the world, um, courts were simply shutting their doors. And I think the... Um, was well, that an option, actually closing them? Yes, it was. And there were many people, including um, um, particularly in the legal profession, who thought that I should close the courts. And I think what happened around the world was that f few people um, were looking over the horizon. It's difficult now to look back at those days in, in February and then March 2020 when lockdown came along. But most people seem to think, well, this is, this is like a bad flu um, epidemic. And so it's probably going to be over in yes. six weeks or eight weeks. And so shut everything down and then you can start up again. Well, um, I, I, I'm no great scientist, nor, nor do I pretend to be an epidemiologist. But I did read quite a lot of the, of the uh, expert material that was coming out at the time. And it seemed to me that that was unlikely to happen. And so I, I took the view, and I must say Robert Buckland was completely supportive in this, uh, uh, as were senior he being officials. The he was the Lord Chancellor yes, at the time, actually. forgive me, yes. Mm. Um, that we had to keep things going um, because stopping and then restarting is much more difficult in life generally, actually, than winding down and winding back up. And the only thing we had to stop for a very short time uh, were jury trials because we had to put in place um, safety arrangements to enable all the large number of people who have to be present in court for a jury trial uh, to be there. Uh, but we only stopped for seven weeks and then we started off gradually and within months the system was beginning to get, get, going, to get again. going again. Although of course we're still trying to deal with the backlog. Yes. I mean there is a backlog that arose yes. from Covid and it's yes. still being tackled isn't it? Yes that's right. The, the um, the outstanding caseload, roughly at the moment, is a little over 50% more than it was when COVID struck. And COVID itself is largely responsible uh, for that. Um, additionally, as you know, um, there was a, a dispute between the government and the criminal bar, um, which led to action in 2022. Um, that had an impact on the outstanding caseload. And the other phenomenon, which I think is not um, sufficiently understood, is that the, the mix of cases and the nature of the cases that are in the outstanding caseload, um, it's, more, it's more complicated. It's bigger cases, it's longer cases. Um, most Crown Court trials only last two or three days. And all you need is for the average length of a trial to go up by half a day, say, and mm. it'll have a very profound um, knock-on effect. Knock effect. And, th and that's, what, uh, that's what the system is having to cope with at the moment. Um, but can I just make this observation, that I think it's wrong to fixate on the outstanding caseload. The truth is nobody would mind if the outstanding caseload were twice what it is, but they were all dealt with quickly. And so what I would encourage people to do is look particularly at the figures of the proportion of cases in the Crown Court that remain outstanding after six months and after 12 months. Um, they're much higher than they were three years ago, um, but 
the position still is that most cases are dealt with relatively quickly. So that was a was a huge challenge, but you think on balance that it was it's been tackled reasonably well. Yes, I, I um I mean all I can do is really reflect on what people say to me from from around the world. Um one one of the silver linings, it's an awful thought of COVID, was that it brought um, the judiciaries around the world closer together because we all learned how to use Zoom and Teams. Hmm. And so rather than um, l limiting our face-to-face uh, -face contact um, to visits, coming, people coming to London or me going somewhere else, um, we, were, we, were, we were soon having Zoom meetings and Teams meetings. Um, and there was an enormous camaraderie, particularly in the Commonwealth nations, of sharing experiences and all collectively trying to help each other get our systems going. And uh, one, one of the things that uh, undoubtedly was uh, said often was that in, in this jurisdiction, um, we kept things going rather better, I don't like using the word, you'll understand that, but rather better than many, many others. Well, you did better than the churches, didn't you? Which will close down, well, as I recall. I don't, think I, I, I don't think I would wish to lock horns with the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> I'd like to take you back now, right back to where you grew up and your schooling. You, you grew up in uh, Sussex, I think. Our family was based in um, Sussex and I had uh, grandparents who were in Sussex, but we did, uh, as a family, travel. Uh, my, my parents, uh, my father worked in Africa on three different occasions, and so we spent time as children abroad. He was um, a newspaper executive. Is essentially, that? he started as a, um, in both Ghana and Nigeria, um, uh, running uh, newspapers there as a very young man, and then later, in his mid-30s, he ran the Thomson subsidiary in Malawi, which had papers, printing factories, bookshops, all sorts of things. It was yes. a, a, a very interesting uh, so you moved all around the place? So we as, moved as... around, and by the time we were there, uh, I was uh, 12, I think, and so I was being schooled in England. But uh, And did your mother work as well, apart from in uh, the home? Uh, not, she, she did on and off, um, and just as well, because unfortunately my father was, um, was uh, felled by a stroke when he was 44, and so my mother had to pick up the pieces. That, that was a bit of a blow for I was an the whole family, I'm sure. I was an undergraduate at the time. It's difficult, uh, it's difficult actually to think back to how it really did affect hmm. uh, any of us, but undoubtedly it was a, one of the most profound in influences in my life. Of course. So you, you, by that time you were at university, but you went to school. You went to a Roman Catholic boarding school, I think, didn't you? I did, yes. Where was that? Was that that was in, in um, Portsmouth, in South Sea, St John's hmm. College, South Sea. It was a direct grant school, which was a, uh, they've, they've long, long, long since um, ceased to exist, but they were um, independent, but um, supported um, through a lot of state scholarships. That's so did, did you go on a scholarship? I did, yes, yes. I did. And, and you stayed there and you, you went all the way up and you then, why did you decide to then go to read law at university? Well, I, I, it, it's, it's, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think back um, at how things were, this is 45 and more years ago. Um, the, the thinking was that I should um, apply for Oxbridge um, and do so in my fourth term. Um, in those days, a lot of people finished their A-levels and then did another term at school yes. and applied for Oxbridge um, at, that, at that stage. And so the question simply was, well, what are you going to read and what do you want to do? And like so many people, um, I remember this vividly, sitting around the kitchen table with my parents when I was 17. And it was the, well, what, what are you going to do debate? <laughs> you must which, have a job. <laughs> which, which, which I guess um, uh, many people have. And uh, the law interested me. It, I, I was thought to be a reasonably good debater, for example, and I could speak in, in public. So I thought quite long and hard about it. We, 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 we um, had a, um, uh, a friend who was a lawyer. Um, 
and I spoke to him and he thought it might be a reasonably good course for me and so I, f I decided then that I would read law and I was interested in the bar. So when you went to university you had that in mind as a career by then? Yes because I decided to read law. I have always said that I rather wish I'd read history which is what fascinates me and I read a lot of, of history um, but I read law because I had decided by then I wanted to become a barrister and it's quicker if you read law. That yes. Uh, just to go back on what you said about the tragic early death of your father, you said that had a huge impact on you. Are you saying it would have shifted your view of where you went in life or what you did or in what way do you think, apart from the obvious loss? Well, I think it, it, um, it uh, imbued a real sense about the fragility of life and how you can take nothing for granted. And also I think it um, instilled in me a sense of caution when looking at things like finances. You know, you've always got to be aware that however, thing, however good things may be at the moment, they may not be in the future. And, and was your family left uh, hard up? Well, no, I wouldn't say that because, in fact, what, 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 what happened was that um, he had a stroke and was then um, in uh, a very bad way and institutionalised for 13 years before he died and he had made reasonable provisions. So, but, but things changed completely, completely. Of course, yes. of course. So you, you then went off in, into the bar and um, you, did you have a particular area of law that you were interested in? Well, I think I was actually rather naive um, uh, about what... Um, what I, what I wanted to do. Um, there were areas of law that I studied as an undergraduate which I knew I wouldn't want to spend my whole life um, dealing with. And I was, I, was interested in, I was interested in law as it affects ordinary people. Um, and I was very interested in, in um, what was then a, a, a sort of fairly nascent subject of, of administrative law that, it, that had interested me. And so I joined a common law chambers where um, in, the early, in the early years, um, in those days, one did a little bit of everything. So I do, you know, personal injury, family, landlord and tenant, contract, and, and, and some minor crime, not real crime. Um, it, it, it was driving offences. So these were the days when the big clients of chambers were insurance companies, and in those days, insurers would pay for junior counsel to go along and fight careless driving cases and plead guilty to drink driving and all these things. And um, so one was in court day in, day out, actually learning how to be an advocate, learning how to convince magistrates. Compared with life as a judge, did you like it at the bar? Um, I, I had an absolute whale of a time at the bar. I really enjoyed what I did. I was very lucky um, to develop a, a, f a fairly big practice quite early on and um, then became involved in public inquiries. Um, you did. I mean, that's really, I would say, where you made your name, isn't it? Well, I would, again, this is... In, 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 in life, a lot happens by chance and through luck. So um, I was... I'm trying to think how many years call... Seven years call, so only five five years in practice um, when the King's Cross fire occurred and um, uh, I was instructed as a junior counsel to the inquiry that then followed. That gave me a taste for public inquiries and, and doing sort of huge cases. Yes. Um, and well, I, you, obviously, you obviously enjoyed and you were obviously very good at it, but how stressful was it? I, 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 uh, I know from speaking with Lord Phillips that he found doing the BSE inquiry incredibly stressful. Yes, I, I, I have a, a, a way of sort of internalising difficulty and, and recognising that I'm being um, asked and paid to do, to do a job and get on and do it. Um, and um, so intense hard work, intense hard work, that inquiry and then all the others I did, um, 
but n not stress in the sense of worrying that um, we wouldn't be on top of a topic in time for the um, hearings that we were going to be doing. Um, no deadlines. M m most of us, most of us work need deadlines to work to. Um, if you don't have a deadline, you just drift. In my, in, in my experience. <laughs> and if you were to, we can't go into each one. I mean, you, you dealt with a, a series of very big, high profile inquiries. But if you were to pick one that you either found the most challenging or in, in any way the most satisfying in terms of conclusions, wh which would it be? Well, um, I, I think uh, the Guildford 4 inquiry is, is, is the one that I would... Um, focus on because that was a that that was a case um, which threw up a, a lot of thinking about what was not working properly in difficult high profile criminal cases and of course it it it, it led not only to that inquiry but then there was the uh, the royal commission that 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 followed that was phenomenally hard work and we also had the inquiry in parallel into the convictions of the Maguire family um, which, which represented a serious miscarriage of justice um, and it led to it led to profound changes. It did I mean you touched on miscarriages so let, let's have a, a, a chat about that do you think the system basically now is working adequately there's always criticism of the current system for miscarriage, dealing with miscarriages, isn't there? Yes. Well, no, no, si review. no system works perfectly um, because uh, any system of justice depends upon fallible human beings. Um, fallibility usually without any underlying malice um, or um, lack of bona fides, but sometimes fallibility, which is the result of um, people cheating, to put it bluntly. Um, disclosure has been a, 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 a curse for years and we still have cases uh, coming out of the woodwork um, where um, inadequate disclosure has uh, resulted in uh, wrongful convictions. I don't think any system can, can get rid of them, but what we do need is uh, an e e efficient and effective way of dealing with miscarriages of of, of justice. Now, of course, um, this is slightly a, a nerdy special subject. Back in, in the days of, of Guildford 4 and that inquiry in the early 90s, um, there, there was no Criminal Cases Review Commission. Uh, there was a department within the Home Office um, which was responsible for um, looking at miscarriages of justice and re referring cases uh, to, the, to the Court of Appeal. Um, and the decisions were made by, by, by ministers very conscientiously in, in my experience of, of, of uh, the decisions that I uh, was aware of. But obviously one of the great uh, reforms that came out of those miscarriages of justice was the Criminal Cases Review Commission. It was. I mean, it has come under fire itself subsequently, hasn't it? I mean, do you think it's, how in the world do you think it's working at the well, moment? Well, yeah, all, all organisations come under fire. Um, sooner or later and sometimes uh, fairly and sometimes unfairly but I think the the, the Criminal Cases Review Commission over the last uh, is it now nearly 25 years maybe it's more um, has it is more has done um, a, a, a pretty good job like all these organizations it's actually um, starved of resources and in, in the end um, when you're looking at uh, cases that might have gone wrong, it requires time of suitably qualified and experienced people, and that's expensive. Could I ask you about one of the in inquiries that you did, or really an inquest? Mm. You appeared as counsel uh, in the Diana and Dodi are fired inquest. How was that? It was a very, very high profile event. How did you find it? Well, um, it was, I, I think, probably the hardest six months of non-stop work I ever did in my life. In advance of it, um, the 
coroner or assistant deputy coroner as he was, uh, Sir Scott Baker, who was a Court of Appeal judge, uh, and I d decided that we would look at every single one of the competing and inconsistent conspiracy theories that surrounded that crash in Paris in 1997. Goodness, that's quite a piece of work. We also decided that because we had a jury, we had to finish the whole thing in six months. I do reflect that if it had been a public inquiry and not a, an inquest with a jury, you know, we might have rambled around for three years, but we, we had to do it within six months. We had a wonderful team of counsel and solicitors and administrators working for the uh, inquests, and we went through everything. And what it really taught me is that the forensic process of exploring evidence through cross-examination is so valuable because it was a very good example of something which had been the subject of book after book, article after article, just repeating whatever people had been saying as if it were gospel. And it all read fine. Yeah. It all read fine, as long as you didn't read two different conflicting conspiracy theories at the, within, a, <laughs> within a week or two of each other. And it all looked plausible. But get some of these witnesses to come along and then just ask them a few questions. And it, it demonstrated just how flaky they the were. whole thing was. And in, in some cases, I, I won't give examples now, but it was simply a question of one or two questions which completely destroyed the whole edifice that the person concerned was trying to um, erect. And it was a fascinating, fascinating experience. Do you have any particular regrets yourself over any one case that perhaps you think, I wonder if I really got the right result there? That's a, that's a, that's a question I, 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 I wasn't... Um, I wasn't expecting, and I don't think, um, e even if uh, there were one or two cases lurking at the back of my mind, um, that I would um, take this opportunity to tell you about them. Or, or to um, put it another way, did you ever lie awake at night worrying about quite what to do or a sentence to impose or anything of that nature? I, I don't lie awake at night. <laughs> I just don't. and. Um, I struggle to see actually how anyone could hold down a, a really demanding job if they really did lie awake at night. It's, is it a quality, but, a quality to have the jobs that you held, would you say? Well, I, think it, I think it helps, but, but um, I actually um, often agonised over sentencing decisions when I was um, both a recorder um, and then a high court judge. Um, Many of the decisions as a recorder were much more difficult than the decisions as a high court judge. Why was that? Because there you're often making a real decision about whether somebody should go into custody or stay out. And um, that is a huge difference in terms of its impact upon a, a defendant. When you're a high court judge, um, more often than not, you're dealing with murder. And, and so um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of difficult uh, analysis and thinking that has to be done uh, about the minimum term, in, but you have a life sentence. Manslaughter decisions I found very uh, troubling um, because the uh, degree of culpability in manslaughter um, can range from the almost not culpable to the very culpable, and those decisions are hard. And the, the others that I always found uh, I had to think really carefully about and, and did worry about um, were sentencing for sexual offending, where again the culpability um, can, can range very, very widely.
But can you just explain that a little bit when you say, was that a worry that you don't know whether to, the person is guilty or? No, no, no. Um, or is it to do with the length of the sentence? The length of the sentence. Because how, yes. how culpable were they? Well, you, you look at, you, I mean, the, the classic is, 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 is you look at um, um, rape and um, the sentencing guideline has a, uh, a particular starting point, but the range is enormous. Yes. And, and so, um, particularly in sexual offending, I think that that is a difficult, a difficult task, and it's also a very sensitive task it because is. you'll never please everybody in in sentencing Indeed. and in sexual offending. Um, it's it's even more difficult. So you 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 decided you were you had your successful career at the bar, and you then, as you say, you became a recorder, and from that you started moving up the. A judicial hierarchy. Had you always imagined you would become a judge? Never. No, it didn't occur to me. I mean, I, 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 I started as a, a sort of bright-eyed 22-year-old um, barrister, um, rather astonished that anybody was instructing me to do anything. <laughs> um, and then, you know, after a few years, um, particularly when uh, the in inquiry work and the public law work was building and then I became one of the junior treasury council at quite a young age. Um, you know, it, it, it seems, well, sooner or later I perhaps ought to get into silk. Um, and then that happened and I enjoyed that enormously and I, I was lucky enough to do a, a number of the really big public law cases of the day. Um, and I, I got to, I, I got to be 49, and was working much too hard, much too hard. Um, to the extent that you thought your health was at risk well, or your family I, were complaining? Yeah, I was getting very, very clear um, advice from home that this cannot go on forever. Um, <laughs> and um, so it, it was in those circumstances that I thought, well, if, if they'll have me, as a High Court judge, I'll... That I'll would make, be a good I'll, move. I'll give that a go. You'd have regular hours, you would be able to... Well, and also... I, confine your work. You, you, you're, you're, the, you're more in control in, in, in a way, although obviously you, you do the cases you're told to. Um, but um, the, 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 the biggest difference about being a judge is that you don't have the pressure of clients. You go into court to hear a case, and you're not there worrying about who's going to win. And uh, I don't know whether that's a general view that judges would have, that the release of the pressure of clients and you know, the, the, the luxury, actually, of being able to, to listen and then decide, uh, as opposed to when you're an advocate, you're, you're going in and you really want to win for your client because that's what they want to happen. So that's a huge, a huge change. It is, and also presumably, you have you're in a position of power as a judge. Is that something that you were aware of at the time? Responsibility as well. Yes, re responsibility rather than 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 power. Um, I think it, you know, I think it really important that um, judges don't go onto the bench with private agendas of any sort. And I've also thought it important that judges should strive never to become the story themselves. Um, or, or become the story by accident. Or by accident. Well, they can't help that, perhaps, and, uh, and, sometimes. Um, I mean, I was given uh, very, very sage advice uh, from a, a, a judge who had been a, a good friend and who I'd worked with before he went on the bench, who said, when you, when you, when you give judgments, try not to um, have anything in them that is calculated to grab a headline. <laughs> that's no good for journalists. No, 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 but um, <laughs> it, it, yeah, but that's certainly... That, that was a name. That, that's how I looked at it. And did you, have you any um, notion of how you might be perceived or how you perceive yourself in the sentencing spectrum? Do you regard yourself as quite a tough judge or as a soft judge, if those terms are applicable, or neither? Mm. Well, um, I, I think we've spoken before, Francis, and I have said publicly on many occasions now um, that the, there is no serious debate about penal policy in this country at the moment. Uh, we've got to the stage where um, 
one party, one, one of the main political parties, uh, constantly is seeking to ramp up the length of sentences, and the other main political party is saying, yes, and do it even more. I'm caricaturing it, but there is, there is an element of, of, of uh, that uh, going on. When one looks at what's happened to sentencing over the last 20 years, and I, I gave quite a heavy-duty lecture on this at the end of um, uh, 2020 at uh, UCL, um, in all areas, the average sentence given for serious crimes has gone up very significantly, very significantly. Now, is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? Now, in the short term, obviously, if somebody is in prison, um, they're not going to be committing offences outside prison. So that, 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 to, to, to that extent, um, uh, crime is contained uh, to, to, to some degree. But looking at things more broadly, I think there's a serious question about whether lengthening sentences is, is actually good in the public interest, good for society. And it's, 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 it's not only questions of the money that gets thrown at it, but I ask myself internally what I hope politicians of all parties will be asking. Why is it, and is it a good thing, that sentences in England and Wales are so much longer than sentences in France and in Germany and in Italy and in Holland and Scandinavia? And is it actually producing benefits to society that can be measured, that are tangible? And your answer would be that it isn't. Well, my, my answer would be that, that such um, academic research as there is out there um, would suggest that it isn't. Now, um, punishment is, is one of the primary purposes of uh, sentencing. It's not the only purpose. And the, it's, a, it, it's, it's a balance for society through its political system to determine uh, how much punishment, pure and simple, should be uh, determining uh, sentences. But my real worry is that we've just had a constant ramping up, actually for as long as I've been a, a, a judge, and I personally need persuading that it's doing a great deal of good, and I'm not persuaded at the moment. Well, you must have mixed views about the um, current government plans, because on the one hand, first of all, we're going to have the sentencing debate you would like. Secondly, we're going to be getting rid of short sentences of up to a year and their replacement with community sentences, short jail sentences, I should add. Yes. And, but on the other hand, the most serious crimes are going to be uh, given longer sentences if these measures go through Parliament, mm. which of course they may not. What is your feeling about that package of measures that have just been announced? Well, um, they're, they're going to come in legislation before Parliament soon, um, and I'll have an opportunity to look at the legislation in draft, the bills, and make contributions in the House of Lords. Um, so I, I'm, I don't think it appropriate for me on the back of the King's speech, which was um, inevitably in, in very outline, um, to um, make any, any detailed comments. Uh, but from what you, you from what you just said, you would approve of the measures uh, to 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 reduce short sentences. Yes. And you, but you would have concerns or would like to look yes. at the proposals for longer ones. Well, so far short sentences are are, are concerned. Um, the the position is much more complicated than most people understand, and this gives me an opportunity to to make to make a point which I think needs to be made uh, frequently is that association from with outcomes does not necessarily mean causation. So we keep hearing in uh, public discourse that uh, short sentences don't work because reoffending rates are very high. Um, and, and that uh, association is entirely true. Uh, what is often overlooked is that those who get short sentences uh, in, of imprisonment have, as often as not, had many 
non-custodial sentences which have, as it were, failed. So uh, I uh, have long thought that uh, many short sentences um, really serve no real purpose other than to punish and it, none of the other a aims of sentencing um, are served uh, uh, at all. And so I would certainly like to see um, more effective community penalties and punishments. Um, th th there are ways in which uh, punishment can be achieved with community sentences now, which couldn't be done even 10 years ago. So um, something I've long thought um, is true is that um, f particularly for relatively young offenders, rather than putting them in prison, um, give them a tough community sentence with, a, with an overnight curfew. Now, it's a few years since we were 19, 20 or 21, but that's quite a punishment for um, a, a, a young man. And similarly, community orders that, that have intense um, uh, supervision by probation, that have work requirements. Now, all of these will require a great deal of enhancement by the government of the availability of probation support and, and of all the um, bits and pieces that are necessary to make community sentences um, available. Resources. So, resources. They will need resources. A very good idea, in my view, that particular um, proposal, um, to make sure that only those who really can't be punished in a different way um, go, go to prison for a relatively short period of time. But please don't anyone think that at a click of a finger that can be achieved because the probation service isn't in a position to deliver no. at the moment and it will need to be nurtured, enhanced, and please don't think that this will be a cheap option. Um, but it will help reduce the prison population. More importantly, it's the churn of, of, of short sentences, yes. um, it, which is very labour intensive for the prison service. Yes. Now, how do you sell this to the public? Because is one of the problems that um, you, you, the judges generally have views such as you've just set out, and the public are more punitive, I think, are they not? Well, um, that's why the government are proposing yes, these tougher uh, sentences. I, I would simply answer that by saying, well, are they? Um, it, 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 it's true that when people don't know the circumstances of the offending or the offender, um, some are apt to think, well, whatever sentence was imposed wasn't long enough. But the Sentencing Council, um, when it works up its guidelines, does a lot of what in effect is market research to try to find out what people think. And the reality is that when people know the facts, when they know a little bit more about what's going on, um, then they understand. You don't think there's a mismatch between what the public wants and feels and the kind of people who become judges or who reach the top of the judiciary? I, I, I just don't feel I'm in a position to um, gauge what the public feels because, you know, the, we've got 68 million people in, in the United Kingdom, 60 million of them roughly in England and Wales. Yes. I can't remember how many are adults. but. Well, I think polls have shown, haven't they, that people generally think that sentences have been soft and, or have not gone up, when in fact they have, as yes, you well said, that, they've gone up a lot. But that, that rather is the problem, isn't it? Um, normally in life, you don't accord much weight to a view which is detached from reality. I appreciate politics is different, and I don't mean that discourteously, it's simply that that's the way life really is. But you've put your finger on it. If you were to take a poll of people not in the Strand here, but take, go, go into a big town in England and Wales and just take a poll and ask people, have sentences gone up in recent years? I suspect you're right that most people would say no. But given that that fundamental premise is wrong, should we be reacting and 
deciding policy on the basis of premises which are demonstrably false? Or should our political class be saying to the public, actually, this is the reality, and let's have a debate on the reality, not on fantasy? When you were uh, Lord Chief Justice, you had to deal a lot with ministers. How did you find those dealings? Well, um, I think I had um, quite an advantage when I became uh, Lord Chief Justice that I had spent a, a great deal of my time at the bar, uh, from really from about 1990 onwards, so I was quite junior, advising the government. Uh, about half my work was advising the government in one way or another and dealing with senior officials and ministers. So I had a reasonable amount of um, experience uh, of it. Um, it was something that uh, I always enjoyed um, because ministers, even if sometimes in public they, you know, they get a really bad press, um, pretty well all of them are there trying to do their best for the nation as, as they see it. And um, so it was always interesting. Um, I, I had cordial personal relationships with all of the ministers I had to work with, prime ministers, secretaries of state, law officers. Um, did they did, listen to you? Uh, yeah, certainly, they listened. Um, did they ever turn, turn down your requests or not well, seem to be sympathetic to your I, I concerns? Shan't, one thing I, I, I will never do is breach any, any, any confidence, um, but it would be um, a, a very odd state of affairs uh, if in six years of activity as Lord Chief Justice with um, literally dozens of law officers and Lord Chancellors and a, a handful of Prime Ministers that um, we saw eye to eye on absolutely everything. But the, 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 the critical thing is that the judiciary needs to understand the position of the executive and the executive needs to understand the position of the judiciary. We have to respect our different spheres of, um, of uh, constitutional responsibility and um, work to ensure that the whole thing functions properly. And, and the same with Parliament, because I have relationships yes. with Parliament. And looking at those three arms of the Constitution, the judiciary, which you were heading, of course, since the constitutional reforms of some years ago, Parliament and the executive, do you think the judiciary uh, had a proper standing? And do you think its, 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 its power position is within that, those three? Is it, is it uh, equal? Oh, uh, it, it was Alexander Hamilton he of the musical fame yes. when, when, when he was, I think when he was vice president of the USA in the early days, he was quite a constitutional thinker. Um, and he described the, the judiciary as one of the three arms of the state, but the weakest arm. And it, it's the weakest arm because in the end it doesn't make the laws. And in the end it needs the executive to fund it and, or parliament, and it needs um, outside agencies to enforce its um, its will. So um, in, in terms of uh, who's the most powerful, powerful um, it, 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 it's not the judiciary. That said, I don't think any government um, would, would um, uh, deliberately court a, uh, a fight with the judiciary because, um, to use that uh, marvellous phrase which uh, led a cabinet minister 30 years ago to storm off an, an interview. So Robin Day described him as here today, gone tomorrow, which, yes. was, which was not, not very polite, even if accurate. Um, I mean, the, ju the, the, the judiciary carries on. Um, so there's never been, there's, in my time, uh, a fight between government and judiciary. No. Um, you know, we, 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 we've, we've had different points of view on certain things, which we resolve Privately, I think it's really important that um, these uh, differences of opinion um, should be resolved privately and responsibly and, and not erupt onto the front pages of newspapers. 
Have you actually seen Hamilton, the musical? I regret to say I haven't. I've read much of what he wrote, but um, I haven't seen the musical. <laughs> okay. Because actually music is one of your loves, isn't it? It is, yes. Do, do is. you sing or play an instrument? Not, not now. Um, <laughs> I, 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 was a, I sang a lot as a, as a, uh, as a boy treble and then... I, in I a was, church choir? In or? a cathedral choir. And then, Which uh, cathedral uh, was Portsmouth that? Portsmouth Cathedral. And, uh, I then also, I sang when I was an, an, an undergraduate. I played the piano indifferently, and um, <laughs> um, so I, I, I gave that up, save occasionally late at night, um, when, when, the, when, when I was moved to try something and play it very badly. But I, I listened to music um, all the time. I couldn't, I, I couldn't function without um, who is Who listening. is your, one of your favorite composers? Oh, well, it depends on my mood. Um, I, was, I don't know if I'm the only person who thinks this, but um, when I'm feeling, I, I love, I, I love opera, um, and um, uh, at the moment I'm listening to a lot of Rossini, underrated in my view, um, and I love all the bel canto operas, uh, so Bellini and Donizetti, and then moving through to to Verdi. If I'm in a gloomy mood, I listen to Wagner. <laughs> Sorry, this was a digression. <laughs> no, no, you, um, anyway, you've got to come me back going. To, I could, I could go on for back, hours about To come back music. to the uh, relations with judges and ministers, I'm just wondering whether you think, and maybe not in your time, but in the last, say, 30 years, the relationship has changed. We've had, we've had a massive turnover of Lord Chancellors, as you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. Your role as Lord Chief Justice is different. It's, it's more powerful in that you have to represent the judiciary. And... Um, has there been, I wonder, also a change in attitude from some ministers to the, to the standing of the judiciary and maybe the rule of law? Well, I, what I fear is that um, increasingly um, politicians generally and some ministers don't really understand the judiciary and, if I'm being honest about it, don't really have it in their bones a feel for the constitutional arrangements that we have. And that's not just the judiciary, it's Parliament, Parliament as well. And um, I do think that the uh, change in the nature of the Lord Chancellor um, has had uh, an effect in uh, reducing the power of a voice at the centre speaking for the judiciary and for the rule of law. Um, you'll know that I've now spoken on a number of occasions about my personal uh, view that the Constitutional Reform Act arrangements need looking at, and in particular the role of the Lord Chancellor. Um, I, I think you would like a separate Lord Chancellor again, a separate, separate from the prisons department, for yes, example. Yes, and... and um, what, what, what I envisage is, is the need for a, a Lord Chancellor um, whose primary function is to uh, look after the justice system, uh, regulating the legal profession, um, be responsible um, in government for the support of the judiciary, um, the rule of law, and also probably constitutional matters which would fit very neatly with that. Um, I, 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 my own view is that uh, having the Lord Chancellor with all his really important statutory responsibilities and constitutional responsibilities for the judiciary and the administration of justice um, lumped together with uh, prisons uh, and, and probation um, has, has meant that the focus not only of the ministers but also inevitably of the department is principally on those things which are politically difficult. Now, I gave to the detriment to, of the judiciary, well, to, legal to, aid, or courts? to the neglect of uh, all of the uh, other aspects. So, I, I think I um, months and months and months ago said publicly that the, 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 with prisons, um, a, a crisis in the prisons would in, inevitably divert the attention of ministers and, and officials. Now, um, we, we, are, we are having a crisis in the prisons, as, as we know, because they're full, um, and the government is now having to take measures to uh, reduce the pressure. Um, but that is an enormous 
um, problem, which I don't personally think should be um, absorbing the time and energy of the cabinet minister responsible for the administration of justice and the rule of law and the regulation of the legal profession, legal aid, and all these and, and all these uh, other things. And the other the other thing that um, is is so striking about what's happened in recent years is that we've moved away from Lord Chancellors being appointed uh, for a long period. We've moved away from Lord Chancellors being appointed um, who have been very senior ministers um, and doing the Lord Chancellor role at the end of their careers. In other words, having somebody responsible for the administration of justice, speaking for the rule of law, speaking for the judiciary, um, who isn't looking for the next job. And so being absolutely blunt about it, I don't think it's good for the administration of justice and all of the things that surround it to have what is perceived to be a middle-ranking cabinet minister who, frankly, would like to be a more senior-ranking cabinet minister uh, there for a relatively short period. So look back at what, 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 what we had. Um, obviously, pre-Constitutional Reform Act, the um, likelihood was that a Lord Chancellor would be in post for a whole parliament. The Lord Chancellor would be able to insist insist that the Prime Minister give him uh, time to introduce legislation for what I've always called constitutional plumbing. And it was a point I think that um, Lord Mackay, James Mackay, made to you when you interviewed him last, la la last year. Um, yes, you'd like to go turn the clock back in that regard anyway. Yes, not, 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 not all of them. Not reforms. all of them. No, no, no. Simply, simply to have, um, again, if we wind the clock forward, um, uh, once the Constitutional Reform Act came in, um, and uh, Lord Faulkner was the first Department of Constitutional Affairs, it sounds faintly Orwellian, but, but actually it was a good mix of things. Um, uh, Jack Straw became Lord Chancellor. He had been Home Secretary. He had been Foreign Secretary. He had no political ambition. Um, and it was in his time, uh, I think, that the prisons uh, came, came over. Um, and I know he and I have talked about this. He doesn't think he doesn't agree with me about um, uh, uh, shearing them off. Well, then there was a change of government in 2010, and Ken Clark became Lord Chancellor. Now, you know, he had been Chancellor of the Exchequer, he had been Home Secretary. There was almost no cabinet position uh, he hadn't occupied, and again, he was somebody without political ambition. And since then, we've had um, a, a series of mostly very short term Lord Chancellors. Um, that in part has been due to the turmoil in politics generally since uh, uh, 2016 or thereabouts. But I don't think it's been good for the administration of justice. Do you also see a change in the attitude in recent administrations to uh, respectful rulings of the court, to the rule of law generally? And perhaps even, what about Boris Johnson? He's been accused of a flagrant disrespect for the rule of law. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to talk, talk about um, individuals, particularly individuals with whom I had a professional relationship as, as, as Lord Chief um, Justice. Um, look, looking at it sort of more widely, um, there have been things said by ministers, uh, which, as I think I've put it before, um, suggest um, a, a, a less than a confident grasp of what the rule of law means and what the independence of the judiciary means. Uh, and I think that that is uh, uh, unfortunate and I hope that we see less and less of it. We are seeing uh, less of it. Um, I mean, I would say that uh, our current Lord Chancellor and our current Attorney General, um, both of whom I know very well, um, have the rule of law through their backbones. So this is Alex they, Chalk and Alex Chalk Victoria, and Victoria Prentice. Prentice. Forgive me. The rule of law through their backbones, as if it were a stick of rock with Blackpool up the middle. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and that's what you would like to see? Or? And that's what I would like to yes. see um, unequivocally from 
all ministers, actually. I mean, it's often overlooked that the one thing the Constitutional Reform Act did was to um, state that the rule of law is a constitutional, um, a, a constitutional provision, that the Lord Chancellor has particular responsibilities, but that so far as the independence of the judiciary is concerned, all ministers, all ministers and all public officials must respect the independence of the judiciary, including the judiciary of international courts to, to whose jurisdiction the UK um, submits itself. And that means that you can disagree with a decision of a court, of course. You can say, I'm sorry about that decision, I think it was wrong. But no minister, compatibly with the um, duties imposed by the Constitutional Reform Act, can attack the integrity of a court or the motivation of its judges. What do you feel about proposals which, which flare from time to time about disregarding the European Court of Human Rights or withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights? Well, um, the position in, in UK statute is that the decisions of the European Court are decisions to which our courts must have regard. Um, the European Court itself doesn't have a, a system of precedent as, as we understand it. And as you know, the uh, decisions of the courts here is that ordinarily our courts should follow a settled line of jurisprudence from the, uh, from the Strasbourg Court. And that's what Parliament has said. And so that's, that's what uh, we do. Do you, do you think that constrains courts or constrains politicians, perhaps? They clearly do in some respects. Well, um, it was, um, I think, Lord Irvin of Laird, when, when he was Lord Chancellor, um, who, 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 in the context of some uh, decisions of the courts, which certain of the ministers in, 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 in the Blair government didn't like, um, he said, it's, uh, you don't cheer when you win and you don't boo when you lose. And so I remember that. You remember that. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the point he was making actually was a very straightforward one, that in our system, the courts decide cases, and if you don't like them, you can appeal them. And if you take a case all the way and you lose it, then in our system, with a sovereign parliament, the government can propose legislation. And if parliament agrees, it can change the law. Do you personally have a view about whether it would matter if we pulled out from the European Convention? Well, I'm, I, I mean, I've been around long enough um, to have been arguing human rights cases in court before the Human Rights Act in, in, in 2000. And um, they were un, 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 undoubtedly different um, in, in that the convention wasn't directly applicable. Um, but, but we have seen cases, haven't we, where, uh, for example, in the freedom of speech zone, where um, the common law um, has been pretty robust in, in giving protections. I think the same would be true in broadly privacy areas now. So, so why don't course, we stick with the common law? I mean, would, we, would it matter if well, we I think did the, not have the oversight of the European Court of Human Rights? Would that matter? Well, um, we, we've been party to the Convention since its beginning. Um, leaving the convention um, would have very wide ranging consequences um, and it's not something personally that I have been persuaded is remotely necessary as, as a result of the uh, particular difficulties that seem to animate some of our politicians. Uh, and, and finally on this, would you say that uh, incorporating the Human Rights Act into our law, enshrining it into our law, has that expanded the power of the judiciary? Well, it, it, it required the judiciary to do something which it hitherto had not been doing. Um, and, and, and that is um, consider questions of proportionality. Now, not, this, isn't an this isn't a time uh, to go into the differences between our um, domestic uh, um, administrative law and, and public law and the convention, but there is, there is a significant difference between an, an analysis based on proportionality 
and the analysis in public law, which was based on irrationality and, 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 and its um, adjuncts. And so it inevitably pulled judges into um, areas which are controversial. That was inevitable. Uh, it, couldn't be, it couldn't be avoided. And, and so that occasionally has caused um, politicians to get uh, upset. I mean, they got upset uh, more than occasionally before, um, before we had the Human Rights Act. Um, but it also requires judges to be um, circumspect and astute to recognise the boundaries between the proper sphere of activity of the executive and the legislature and the proper sphere of activity of judges. Talking about uh, uh, the, the boundaries between the executive and, uh, and the judiciary, you famously um, led the ruling that, um, that Boris Johnson's suspension of parliament was mm -hmm. lawful. Mm. And then you were famously, even more famously, overturned. Mm. And it was a unanimous ruling. Mm. I'd like to ask you, first of all, how you felt about that. <laughs> were you upset about it? No, well, ag again, um, <laughs> Uh, in, in our system, and it's, it's, an, it's, it's one of the ironies that the Lord Chief Justice sits from time to time in the Supreme Court and also is inevitably, given the nature of the cases I do in the Court of Appeal or did in the Court of Appeal, um, because they're high profile and important cases, many of them go to the Supreme Court. And it would be, um, it, it would be extraordinary if any judge got too, too worked up about um, being overturned. Um, all, all I think I would say about that decision is that it's, it's well recognised that the um, Supreme Court moved the law on quite a way uh, in its decision. And uh, the, the, the other thing that... Uh, you mean it made law in its yes, decision? Yes, it, it made law in its decision. And, Whereas uh, perhaps at your level, not you personally, I'm talking about, but no, no, at no, the but lower level, in the court of appeal. it would That's have right. been applying the law as you understood it. I think they so. They went on to, to create... Yeah. Law. And the, the other Extended. aspect of the case, which, which, which was um, perhaps rather different in the Supreme Court, was that um, the Supreme Court uh, decided that the prorogation of Parliament uh, was not a proceeding in Parliament for the purposes of the um, relevant legislation. Now, that wasn't, that, that wasn't argued in front of us um, because I assume it was thought to be unarguable. It wasn't actually part of the case that was argued before the Supreme Court either. Um, and uh, so that, that was uh, a part of the decision that uh, uh, I at least was surprised about because it, had, it wasn't even argued before the Supreme well, Court. Is it right or appropriate for judges to extend themselves into areas like that? Well, um, the, the Supreme Court, any court I've sat in, we decide the cases that come before us and if we think it necessary to develop the law, we develop the law. Is it appropriate? It's sometimes unavoidable if that's the, uh, the way the case is being, is being argued. Because well, that was a highly political decision. Were you surprised it was unanimous? I think many people were. Well, the decision, um, for, for reasons that I understand, had to come very quickly, given the circumstances. And so I think it was within three days, wasn't it? You, you may remember it was a, over a weekend yes. um, that the decision was produced, so it was perhaps not realistic to suppose that in that time there would be uh, dissent. multiple decisions or dissent. Because what they would have felt it necessary or at, at least desirable to, for them all to be of one well, voice. I, I, I just don't know what... You haven't felt. discussed it with any of them since? No. I bet you have. That's not what we do. <laughs> it's not what we do. It really isn't, actually. It, it really isn't. And um, um, I, mean, I, I, I have once or twice as, a, as, as an appellate judge um, had the judges who I've disagreed with um, take the trouble to explain to me why they think I was wrong. Um, but uh, I've never done it myself. Did nor, you think it was... I, nor would I, even if I did, think it was wrong. But it, it's a question of constitutional responsibility. So uh, here we dealt with that case um, in the divisional court, as you know. So we were sitting technically at first instance in the high court. Um, we had the three most senior judges in the jurisdiction. Um, we, we formed our view. And uh, our constitutional arrangements are such that on that, in that case, 
Um, my decision was subject to review by another court, and there it is. It, it is, but I think people looking at it from the outside and thinking now of public perception will find it astonishing that you, a senior, the most senior judge in the land, two other very senior judges, and then you get 11 who just say, no, that was completely wrong. Well, I don't think they put it quite as crudely as that, but um, I, th I think um, th th those decisions, um, uh, I mean, it's what now, five years ago, isn't it? Um, doesn't seem like it. Um, those decisions are for the academics and they can, they, they can argue over the bones of those decisions to their heart's content for years to come. Well, what do you say to people who say it was a political decision? And, and some people will say, well, you know, that, that judges who come from a, a particular kind of political spectrum no, 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 of society. No, 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 no. What do you say to that? No, no, no. This, this, is, this, is, this is just not how it works. Um, it's just not how it works. Um, there, there, were, there were interesting and powerful legal arguments being advanced in that case. And don't forget that the, the uh, claimant, one of the claimants, was Sir John Major, um, a former prime minister. So this wasn't, this wasn't politics wasn't in that sense. It wasn't party political, no. Uh, even underpinning the claim itself. And uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court um, uh, considered the arguments and dealt with the case according to the law and gave its decision. I mean, that's how our system works. And, and, and interestingly, the government hasn't legislated to reverse that. No, that's, that's true. Judges, do they leave their politics at the door of the court? I'm confident that they do, yes. Do you know the politics of your colleagues? Almost none. <laughs> I'm not even sure I know my own. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, finally, I'd just like to ask you, looking again at the, 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 the power balance between the judiciary, the executive and ministers, is it, is it about right? Has it changed? What are the threats, would you say, to that uh, power balance or indeed to the rule of law? Well, I, I think things are in a fairly stable place at the, at, at, at the moment. Um, our job as judges um, is to apply the law. Um, obviously, we have a, a lot of potent common law, but the controversial uh, parts of the law that we uh, apply tend to be interpreting statutes and uh, the sort of lorry loads of statutory instruments we get now. Um, and uh, that's what we do. If uh, the decisions are not welcome, they can be appealed. And if the appeal decisions are not welcome, then laws can be uh, adjusted. But I think the balance in terms of public law is very well settled now. Um, one or two uh, decisions, particularly in the Supreme Court, have reasserted some um, orthodox views of, of public law, uh, including one that, of, of, of mine. And um, I, think, I think that's put everything in a fairly calm position. position. Threats, would you say uh, media or would you say funding, lack of? Funding is always, is, is always a, a, a really difficult issue because one recognises that all governments have much more to spend their money on than they have money to spend. Wouldn't matter if they doubled the money the government had, it still would have pressures politically to spend more and more and more. But it's undoubtedly the case that over the course of the, well, the, my whole time actually as a judge and even before that, um, spending on justice um, has suffered. And, and it, it's not, to use the term that I hear some politicians use, it doesn't have retail value. In other words, there's no votes in putting another 100 million into uh, uh, maintaining the courts or building some new courts or, or actually until now um, enhancing the quality of the prison estate and all these sorts of things. Um, but in the end, a system that is starved of funds finds itself struggling to deliver to the public what we want to deliver. And um, there have been some improvements in uh, the, the, the immediate recent past, uh, Alex Chalk and I agreed an enhanced budget for court maintenance, 
earlier this year. Um, and we also um, got agreement from the government that the maintenance budget would, would not be done on a year to year basis, but would be on a would get two years uh, at a time. So we know what's coming yes. next financial year, which I think was a great, um, a, a great development. And um, it's not your area, but of course, funding also for criminal legal aid. And well, that was, yes, you see, that was, I mean, that was starved. It was cut right to the bone, um, essentially through not providing any increases for many years, even though um, obviously there was inflation. Um, but a- again, we've had a recognition, I think, in recent times, certainly uh, for the last uh, year or so, um, that you have to fund these things properly otherwise the system will just degrade you've you've left it in better shape but what would your verdict be on the state of our system now? Are, you th- are you thinking the criminal the justice system but particularly the criminal justice system well so far as the 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 um criminal courts are concerned um i i, I don't think that the uh work that's been done in recent months and over the last year or so in trying to sort out the remuneration for criminal lawyers, not just the bar, uh, most importantly solicitors as, as well. I don't think that story, that debate is, is over um, because the whole system of criminal lawyers has degraded over the last 10 years as a result of two things. The first is that the volume of work going through the criminal courts fell away for reasons that are too complex to go into, but it fell away. So the number of solicitors and barristers also began to fall away. Then the money got squeezed, and so more fell away for that reason. And what I think we're seeing at the moment in trying to recover from what's happened is that you can't rustle up lots of new criminal solicitors and barristers overnight. You can't flick a switch and undo the damage that's been done over really 10 or more years. And so I think that is something that is going to require the um, continued attention of um, government uh, for quite a long time to ensure that the criminal legal aid fraternity, community, solicitors and barristers um, is able to do the work that needs to be done and is self-renewing. Well, without it, there will be there, people won't be convicted, and uh, victims won't get justice, and there'll be miscarriages. Well, w- 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 without it, um, we will be in a position which, on and off, we have been now for the last eighteen months or so, of having courtrooms available, judges available to do the cases if necessary, but one or other side, prosecution or defence, not being able to produce a lawyer to deal with the case. And that's terrible. Now your, your job is now filled by a woman for the first time <laughs> in legal history. Do you think, uh, what difference do you think that will make, maybe to public perception of the judiciary? Yes, I, I, think, it, I think it does make a significant difference to perception. Um, we've had a, a, a woman president of the Supreme Court. We've now got a woman lady chief justice. We have a woman lady chief justice in Northern Ireland. We have a woman, um, uh, Lord Justice Clark, the second most senior judge in Scotland. Um, and we have just had the appointment of another woman to the Supreme Court. So these are significant developments um, which demonstrate um, that in terms of gender balance, what, what, what has happened already in the more junior ranks of the judiciary, I forgive my using that expression, but everybody knows what I mean, where um, gender balance is pretty good, um, is finding its way up into the most senior ranks. And I think that that's an extremely uh, good thing. And it's a very powerful statement of how the judiciary is changing. And albeit we lag behind, more reflective of society as a whole. 
And of course, you're very keen on television cameras coming into court, and that's something you've pushed, mm. and that will help, won't it, when people can actually see judges giving their sentencing remarks. I think you favour more of it, don't you? I do. Um, it, it, took, it took years to get that. Um, it perhaps re reflects the, the need to um, uh, manage these things very carefully to get people to be supportive On of side. it. Because mm. you know, the legal profession is a, is, 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 it, it doesn't embrace change very enthusiastically. <laughs> and it's not just judges. It's not just judges. <laughs> um, but I think that has been a really positive development. And what it's done, quite beyond explaining to the public how the sentences have been arrived at in these controversial cases, it's provided um, easy access explanation to journalists. So I think we're getting better reporting uh, uh, as a result. And the sort of uncovenanted benefit, certainly I didn't appreciate it uh, as, as perhaps I should have done uh, to the extent that it has happened, is that it's shown to the public that judges aren't all 80-year-old men, as you see in dramas. I mean, uh, it, true, judges, high court judges are not are not very young because they've had very successful careers at the bar or as solicitors, and so they're usually in their 50s. Um, but I think a lot of people have been rather surprised to see the number of women, the number of judges from ethnic minorities, and just generally that the high court bench, who, who largely have been delivering the sentencing remarks that have been broadcast, do not look like the public perception. And so that's been really, really positive. This podcast was brought to you by the University of Law. Subscribe now to make sure you don't miss the next episode.